Center Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 19. A young woman, a material witness in a federal case, mysteriously dies of poisoning. Foul play suspected. Pick up what you can, boys. That's all. Roll and complete. Police Ladies and gentlemen, do you get police car performance from the gasoline you are now using? If not, have you tried Rio Grande Quack with Tetra Ethel? You don't have to take our word, just consider the fact. More police cars, fire engines, motorcycles, and ambulances operated by cities and counties in Southern California and Arizona are powered with Rio Grande Quack than all other brands combined. You can get this same gasoline at any independent station, flying the big banner with the word crack upon it. Try a tank full today and learn what police car performance really means. For ideal results, try also the lower cost per mile lubrication, afforded by Sinclair, Pennsylvania, and Sinclair Opening Motor Oil. Sold only in extra measure, tamper proof cans. At no extra cost. Once more, we are honored to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The high efficiency of the law enforcement officers of this state is directly traceable to the fact that there is a maximum of cooperation between all police departments, sheriff's departments, and state police, together with the spirit of cooperation between them and federal law enforcement agents. We have attempted during these broadcasts to tell our listeners true stories concerning the work and activities of these law enforcement agencies, and more particularly, the work of your police department. On rare occasions, because of public policy, it has been necessary to use fictitious names, but at all times, the facts have been authentic and accurate. Tonight, we bring you the story of a case involving the work of federal law enforcement officers, with whom the police department is at all times cooperating. In a highly civilized country such as ours, it has been possible for us to build up a system of law enforcement which has the power of the federal, state, county, and city governments back of it. All of these branches find it necessary each day to cooperate one with the other. As this story unfolds, you will see how important it is for all of these agencies to so cooperate. Professor Lindsley will now go on with the story. <laughs> The story tonight goes back ten years to the Atlantic Seacoast for its opening chapter. Robert Sims, a teller in a Jersey City bank, has, for reasons known best to him, insinuated himself into the friendship of Frank Barton, a prominent young businessman, and a depositor in Sims Bank. Barton, liking the young man, has invited him to a dance at the country club. You're not fun dancing, Bobby. No, I'm just saving enough energy to stand on my feet all day in that teller's cage at the bank tomorrow. What's the matter? Aren't you enjoying yourself? Sure I am, Frank. I'm having a swell time. It was awfully decent of you to ask me out here. Not at all. We're friends, aren't we? Yes, we are. You're a real friend, and I want you to know how much I appreciate all you've done for me. No, nobody should be sure of things unless they put it to a real case. You know the old saying, a friend but fear a friend's infirmity. Yeah, I wonder if you'd still be my friend if you knew all my infirmities. <laughs> I'll take a chance on you anytime. Oh, I wish I was sure. What's that? Oh, nothing, nothing. I... Well, come on. Let's get another highball. All right, let's do it. Hey, Frank. Look at that beautiful blonde just coming in. Yeah, I see her. Who is she? Name's Mary Ross. Do you know her? Yes, lately. Hey, introduce me, will you? I'd like to know her well. Oh, darling. I'm so sorry I'm late. 
I couldn't get away from the family any sooner. You're not angry, dear, are you? Not at all, Mary. I'll take my wraps in, and I'll be with you in just a few minutes. All right, darling. Oh, that's why you didn't introduce me, eh? You old philanderer, Frank. You're a respectable married man. Now, just a minute. This is different from what you think. Now, I understand all right, and I congratulate you. He certainly is gorgeous. Hey, wait a minute, Bob. You don't understand. Now, listen. Uh, let's step out here on the balcony for a moment. I'm going to place a confidence in you that I would never trust to another man. As the cold moon senses the shadows between men on the deserted balcony, fate in the first mesh of a web, destined to entrap three souls, sending a woman to her death and two men to prison. For 15 minutes, Frank Barton seeks to explain his position to his friend, seeks to justify his actions to himself. So you've got to understand me, Bob. I was married when I was just a kid. You know what is just tough puppy love, one other wishing you. And if it hadn't been for my little daughter, I'd have gotten a divorce years ago. As it was, I was more or less satisfied to let things slide along. That was before Mary came. Then I really got to know what love was. Are you sure, Frank, that the 400000 you told me Mary was going to inherit hasn't influenced you? Not a bit. I'd love her if she were penniless. Say, I didn't expect you to say a thing like oh, that. Oh, now, don't get excited, Frank. I believe you. Thanks. I hope you would. Well, I, I trust I haven't bored you to death. Why, of course not. <laughs> you know, they say the confession is good for the soul. Yes, you bet it is. While we're on the subject of confessions, I've got one to make. I'm in a terrible hole. At the bank. What do you mean? I mean that I stole a thousand dollars from you. A thousand dollars from me? Well, what are you talking about? Well, I needed money. I couldn't live on the measly pittance they call a salary. Well, I took a thousand dollars. The bank examiners were coming, and I was desperate. So I drew a thousand dollars from your account to cover my debt. You mean that you embezzled bank funds have been covered from my account? Yes. So that you're nothing but a common thief. Yes, if you want to call me that. It makes us sort of equal, Frank. The only difference is that I stole money and you stole love. Well, well why don't you say something? What are you going to do about it? Ten minutes ago, you were holding forth on friendship. You said you'd take a chance on me any old time. Well, I'll pay the money back every cent of it if you only give me a chance. Well, that's why you tried to build up a friendship between you. Yes, huh? that's why. Because I thought you would be my friend. You've got to help me. Oh, now, wait a minute. Meet me tomorrow night at Tony's, and we'll work out something. You mean you won't tell the bank? Well, I'm not promising anything now. No, if you'll only help me this once, Frank, I'll do anything for you. Anything. <laughs> Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mr. Barton. I've been no see you for a long time. Sit down here? Sure. He's been here about a one hour. He should sit down there in the back of booth. He don't say nothing. He don't order nothing. Okay. Well, don't bother him for a few minutes, Tony. Important business. All the right, Mr. Barton. Call him here if you need anything. Okay, Tony. Hello, Bob. Oh, hello. Gee, I didn't think you were coming. I was getting worried. Move over. Bob, I don't think you need worry anymore. What do you mean, Frank? Well, we both didn't stay beyond tonight. Look here, Bob. The cancellation of that thousand dollars means a lot to you, doesn't it? All right, now it means everything. Well, now I've got a proposition to make, and I'm coming straight to the point. I can't go on to this life of hypocrisy any longer. I go home at night and I stare across the table at the face of a woman I don't love. I'm going to square up my business affairs, leave Mrs. Barton financially provided for, go to California, and later arrange a divorce and get married to the only woman I've ever loved. You're going to leave Mary Ross here until you're divorced? No, I'm not. Well, but you can't take her with you. I know that. You can't take a girl from one state to the other, even if you really love her, without running into the man act. And boy, that's plenty bad. Mary and I have talked the whole thing over, and she's willing to follow my plan. Well, I, I don't see where I fit into all this. You're going to marry her. Me marry her? Hey, what are you talking about? You're going to marry her. Be your husband and name only. Then the three of us are going to California. And as soon as I can get my divorce, you will divorce Mary and I'll marry you. Why, Frank, you must be crazy. Well, when a man loves a girl the way I love Mary, she is crazy. Nothing is going to stop yes, me. But I can't do a thing like that. Give up my position at the bank, my friend. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. 
No, no, you'll have to get somebody else to be your captain. Are you forgetting that thousand dollars, Bob? You don't mean yes. it exactly. You have the choice of marrying Mary and coming to California with us, or spending the winter in a cold, gray jail. You win. I'll do it. <laughs> A few days later, the strangest triangle ever known to criminal history is completed. And Mr. and Mrs. Robert Sims, accompanied by Frank Barton, board a California-bound limited. Arriving in Los Angeles, the trio run a court bungalow large enough to accommodate the newlyweds and the family friends. Barton, a go-getter, soon lands a job. And for several months, the arrangement works smoothly enough. During all this time, however, Sims has made no attempt to find work. And he gradually becomes more insistent in his demand for money as Mary and Frank become more disgusted with his funding. I tell you, I've got to have $100 right now. Now, listen, Bob. Ever since you've been here in California, I've kept you supplied with a reasonable amount of money. And I provided you with a car, and I never asked you to do a day's work. Well, I've tried to get work, and now you ask me for another $100. Three days ago, I gave you 75 and it went in rotten booze. I tell you, I'm fed up on the whole thing. Listen, this time I won't use it on liquor. I'll promise you that. I met a swell little girl the other evening, and she's kind of up against it, and, well, I want to help her out. Yes, I've met some of your girlfriends. And another thing, if you ever bring a bunch of rotten drunks into the house like you did last night, I'm going to beat you to a pulp. Well, hey, listen, Mary is my wife to all your respectable friends. You seem to forget that you're only the lodger here. Why, you dirty rat. Quiet. Mary is coming. If you make any bricks in front of her, you're going to be sorry. Well, oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Frank. Hello, Bob. How do you feel? Oh, not so hot, Mary. I've just been getting a moral lecture from Frank. Well, I don't wonder, Bob. Oh, I guess he's right, and I'm sorry. I'll, I'm going to lay off the liquor. I, I promise, really, I am. Thanks, Bob. I'm sure you'll keep your word this time. Sure, I will. And say, Frank, how about that doll? Okay, here's $20. Now, listen, we're having the reads over tonight for an evening of cards. And try and be there, will you? It's pretty hard to keep on explaining the absence of the alleged husband of a household. Oh, I'll be here. I'll be back about 8 o'clock. Eight o'clock. Nine o'clock. Ten o'clock comes and goes. The card game proceeds as Mary gallantly tries to pass off her husband's absence to her friends by explaining that he's been detained at the office by a big deal he is closing. Then, at 10.30... Open the door, Tom. Somebody must be in a terrible hurry. Oh, maybe it's your husband, Mrs. Barton. Uh, oh, yes, it must be Bob. Uh, will you excuse me a moment? What should we do? Well, this is a new reform squad. And I've come home to play cards. Well, sir, I wasn't I did. Well, you better go right to bed, Bob. Oh, don't bother me. Well, let me talk to my darling little wife here. Speak to me, thanks. Oh, never come between man and wife. Say, that's a good one. <laughs> Say, who are all these people? Introduce me. Why, Bob, this is Mrs. Reed. You know, the lady with the three darling little boys. Oh, sure. The mother of 19 children. Oh. <laughs> hey, let's all have a drink. Let's drink to the mother of 19 children. <laughs> Mary, dear, we must be going. Come, George, I know Mr. Sims is tired. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Reed. Oh, now, dear, just don't you worry. These things will happen. Why, well, even my husband gave me trouble when we were first married. You've got to train them. Good night, dear. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, Mrs. Reed. Good night, Mr. Reed. Good. I'm so sorry. Hey, what's the idea? So you're at it again, huh? Get in the bed. You can't order me around in my own house. Mary, go to your room. I'll take care of it. Oh, do nothing of the kind, Mary. You're my wife, and I'll do the order. Please, Bob, for me. Will you go to bed? We'll have everybody in the whole court away. Oh, me, you little blonde devil. I'm sick of being a husband who's never even kissed by his legal wife. Come here, I'm going to plant a nice big kiss on that lovely little mouth of yours. Take your hands off her. Not feel Take right. Take your hands, hands off her. Who says so? I do. You 
take a swag at me, will you? Well, that's just what I've been waiting for. Now I'm going to give you the fashion I've been wanting to for months. And then when I'm through, I'll take over the duties of a husband. you. calling car 27, car 27 in 26 district, a disturbance at 7 and Primrose Street in the Allen's Court. That's all, Rose and Chris. Mr. Sims, Pop, well, that guy is always... Ah, they're a funny bunch, all right. Here come the cops here. It sure makes good time, too. All right, all right. Give us the end. Good Sims. All right. Open up this door, eh? Open up this door! Quick, we've got a knife! Quick, kill Frank! Hey, what's coming off in there? This drunken swine tried to insult this lady. Is this woman your wife? Oh, uh, she's not his wife. She's my wife, and he's poor because I tried to kiss her. You better drop that knife. Sure, oh, I'll drop it, but now, this lousy bum isn't going to hang around my house anymore. It's just too bad when a man can't kiss his own wife just because of the larger object. Well, come on, all of you. What's the charge? Well, we'll call it disturbing the peace. Things look kind of funny here to me. Maybe headquarters would want to do a little checking up on you, Bird. <laughs> Frightened by the serious situation into which her love for Frank Barton had led her, Mary Ross contested the whole plot for the officers in question. The minor charge of disturbing the peace is dismissed. And Barton and Sims are held in the Los Angeles County Jail charged with conspiracy to defeat the federal statute and with violation of the Mann Act. Mary Ross is held in the $500 bail as a material witness and the preliminary hearing is set for 2 p.m. Thursday, March 12, 1925. Late Thursday morning, Sims and Barton secure the services of an attorney who hears their side of the story. When Mary Ross is led into the courtroom a few minutes before the hearing, the attorney for the defense immediately engages her in conversation. You're Mrs. Sims? Yes. My name is Jackson. Your husband, Mr. Barton, detained me to defend him. And before the hearing begins, I'd like to know your status of the case. Oh, Mr. Jackson, mm-hmm. this is such a terrible thing. I'm so ashamed. Being in jail, I'll never live down in this place. Yes, I can understand how you feel, and I sympathize with you deeply. And I think I've made a terrible mistake. I didn't know what to do when they arrested me. I, I'd never been arrested before. Yes, I understand. Well, those women down in the jail, they told me I'd done a terrible thing. They were horrid to me. What did you do? Well, when I was questioned by the officers, I... I told them the truth. I confessed everything. What? Yes. Now I realize I did the wrong thing. Well, you certainly did. Tell me this. How, uh, what are they, uh, how are they holding you? As a material witness. Oh, only a material witness, eh? What's the bond? Five hundred dollars. You realize then that you're expected to repeat your statements in court? But in any case, nothing will happen to yes, you. I realize all that, but I don't care about myself. I want to get Frank out of this. I love him so. Now, look here, Mrs. Jenny. You listen to me, I'm sure we can get him off. Can we? How? Well, I don't know what to do. Will you agree to let me represent you? Yes, if you can only get Frank off. Very well. Now, I'll post bail for you just as soon as the hearing's over. Now, all you need to do is to agree to speak to anyone. Don't discuss this case with a soul. For everyone to me. You see, if you don't testify, prosecution has no case. And Barton will be released. Very well, I promise. Remember what I said? Here comes the prosecuting attorney now. Well, I beg your pardon, Mr. Sims. There are a couple of matters I wish to discuss with you. Uh, this young lady is my client and has been instructed not to talk to you or anyone else. Now, you kindly make all communications with her through me. Is that right, Mrs. Sims? Yes. Well, you can't do this. I promise not to prosecute you. All I want from you is a statement. Mrs. Sims understands that, but I've advised her not to make any statements. Why, you shite, sir. I'll be careful what you say. You have no right to. To what? Take your principal witness? <laughs> Sorry, old man. Well, I'll object. I'll have you disbarred. Well, well, is this recorded before the church of the Lord? Quiet, the commission. The United States government says it's Frank Barton and Robert Sims. Your Honor, I'm appearing for the two defendants in this case, as well 
well as the woman held his material witness. And uh, as I was called in on this case only two hours ago, I'd, I'd like a little time to confer with my client. You worked pretty fast in those two hours. I'm surprised you haven't prepared your case, too. Your Honor, I'm quite willing to proceed. Now, the prosecuting attorney will stipulate whether the California statute, which does not permit a wife to testify against her husband, also holds good in federal court. Is the prosecuting attorney familiar with the rule in such cases? Your Honor, I, I do not see how this has any bearing on the case. The counsel for the defense has willfully devoted the course of justice in bribing... I object, Your Honor. I've acted merely in my capacity as counsel for the defense. Objection sustained. I beg the court's pardon. Your Honor, I have not had precisely the same question arise before. If the court pleases to give me a little time, I... Please continue until Monday at 10 a.m. The defense attorney's neat point of law successfully ties up the proceedings. His next move is to go bond for Mary Ross. But when the bonding agent appears at the county jail, she is not there. Suspecting attempts to influence his witness, the attorney obtains a writ of habeas corpus from federal judge Paul J. McCormick. And by 10.30 that evening, Mary Ross is delivered into his hands. But the following Monday, at the Glendale Sanitarium, Mary Ross is found dead. Chester Allen of the homicide detail of the sheriff's office takes over the case. How did Mary Ross meet her death? Allen questions Barton and Sims, realizing that the inheritance of $400,000 which she was soon to receive might have been a motive for their interest in her death. Both men acquit themselves on this score. Painstaking investigations revealed that Mary had a slight cold sore on her lips when she and the attorney met Thursday evening. That the sore was worse on Friday when she appeared before the grand jury and refused to make a statement. That she went to the Glendale Sanitarium Saturday morning. That she talked to her attorney at the sanitarium Saturday afternoon and asked him to send East for her brother. That she made a will stipulating that Sims was to get none of her inheritance and that Barton and her brothers were to share it equally. The mystery ends in the grand jury's opinion that Mary Ross had died from an infection contracted through a cold sore on her lips, and the investigation stops until Mary's brother arrives in California. He is not content with the grand jury's verdict. He orders the body exhumed and an autopsy performed. The autopsy reveals that Mary Ross met her death from poisoning. Alan and his colleagues ponder this new development. Now, here's the situation, boys. Barton and Sims are out of the question. This Sims is a rat, but he wouldn't have had the girl poisoned. He shouldn't have. He was in the county jail. Barton loves her too much. He's on the level. Yeah, that's right. But she could have received the wound during that fight at the apartment. Mm, yes, she could have, but we've got no report that she was wounded in the fight. Oh, that's right, we haven't. Of course, she was in the tank at the county jail. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Her attorney testified that she said that the women down there had treated her brutally. Oh, he did. Well, now, there's an angle. You know what those names are. Well, let's ask the matron about this. Mrs. Sullivan, matron at the county jail, offers the officers every cooperation in their investigation. Painstakingly, they questioned the women who had contacted Mary during her three days in jail. After hours of interrogation, the officers have found nothing. They are questioning a shoplifter. You were in the tank with Mrs. Sims? Sure I was. What of it? Did she act strangely? Oh, no. She acted like any high hat Jane does the first time she's in the posy. What do you mean by that? Oh, trying to rich everybody. Like she was better than, than we were, the dirty little snitcher. She's got a lot to be proud of squealing on her old man. <laughs> we're not here to discuss jail ethics. Did she ever say that she was going to end her life? No. She says when she got out, she was going to show Barton how sorry she was that she spilled the beans. Oh, all right. Take her away. Bring in Pearl Washington. Well, we didn't get very far with that one. No, but maybe we'll have better luck with this colored girl. You were with Mrs. Sims up until the time she was ill, weren't you? Sure I was. But Dad won my season. He 
She got what was coming to her, that's a good lesson to them stealing. I wasn't asking for any of you. Oh, but I'll give you mine. Listen, what do you know about this poison? You're with her every minute. I don't know nothing. And if I did, I ain't going to know this. Oh, yes, you are. First thing you know, you're going to be pulled in on a murder charge. A uh, murder charge? I didn't have nothing to do with that there poison. And who did? Nobody, as I know, it just happened, that's all. Oh, we know it happened all right. I think we'll book you if you don't tell us what you know. No, I didn't. Book me for murder. Look at here, I'm a respectable pickpocket. I, I ain't no murderer. Well, let's have a truth, then. Well, the day before court, that girl asked us for some lipstick. And nobody give her none. The old snitch, then one-eyed Maggie, she kicked a sock at her. <laughs> oh, Lord, <laughs> what a lamb, and she gives that blonde girl. You mean Mrs. Sims and Maggie got into a fight? Yeah, then the matron come and she spoiled everything. She put some ointment on the blonde girl's lips. Oh, where it got sweat. Well, what's all this got to do with her getting poisoned? Oh, wait a minute, big boy. Wait a minute. I was coming to death. She wanted lipstick so she could look nice for her fella down the coast. Well, after all, the row cleared up. Nobody given on she. So she picked up one of them artificial roses that we make out of a red paper. And she whistled. And she rubbed the red on her lips. She gave the lipstick. Well? The NFC knew that the dye and the red paper and poison. She, she didn't swallow any of it, did she? No, sir, but I've got to seek it out that some of that dye in the, in the paper, you know, of those uh, roses that we make, got in the store, and uh, she had it on her lips. <laughs> Backwards, the investigators discover that the poison in the dye used in the red flowers is the same as the poison that caused the death of Mary Ross. So the death of the love trapped girl could be blamed on no one. Could be blamed only on her great love for Barton, for whom she threw away social position, respect, and everything. But there still remains to be told the disposition of the plotters of this bizarre case. Sims, after much bargaining, turned state evidence and assist investigators in acquiring sufficient evidence to convict Boston. Tim startled to himself as the jury filed back into the courtroom after having been out for 20 minutes. He anticipates the life he will lead on the $400,000 he will inherit from his legal, if not actual, wife. Have you reached the verdict? We have, Your Honor. Read the verdict. We find the defendant, Frank Boston, guilty of conspiracy to defeat the federal statute and the violation of the Man Act. Well, I guess that lets me out. Well, I guess I'm not so dumb to any state evidence. Tough on poor Frank, but I sure saved my neck. Well, so long, attorney, for the defense. You take that back. Well, what for, Your Honor? I've committed no crime. I, I married the girl in name only. I've done nothing. I understand that. Married the girl in name only. She was never really your wife. You testified to that in this courtroom. Therefore, you are an accessory to the crime. You helped the defendant here in an effort to obtain the man act. I also understand that you have made quite a statement regarding your anticipation of sharing in the inheritance of your late wife, in name only. May I point out to you that if the jury which tries your case tomorrow finds you guilty, you will also automatically give up all claims to the estate of your late legal wife. Sims went on trial and was found guilty. In view of his turning state's evidence, the court sentenced him to the two years in Leavenworth Penitentiary, while Barton received two and a half years. This case is an interesting example of the interrelation between the federal, county, and municipal police organizations and points once more the eternal moral which should be graven in the minds of every youth in the land. The old time-worn but everlastingly true maxim, crime does not pay, be it murder, robbery, forgery, or only a violation of a city ordinance. You cannot beat the law. Crime does not pay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are too modest in your claims for Rio Grande cracked gasoline with Petra Ethel, an enthusiastic motorist to ISA. That is a policy of Rio Grande to tell you only the facts about cracked gasoline. 
That is why we just remind you that the cracking process produces a gasoline that averages 10 points higher in natural anti knock quality than gasoline which are not cracked. But cracked was a forerunner in adding such a ethyl lead. These statements would mean very little if it were not for this proof of the superior acceptance of Rio Grande Crack. Here it is. More police cars, fire engines, motorcycles, and ambulances operated by cities and counties in Southern California and Arizona are powered with Rio Grande Crack with tetra ethyl than all other brands combined. Try Rio Grande Crack for 30 days. Make every test. If you are like thousands of other motorists, you will never change back. I'll send the police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 19. Mystery of the poison woman solved. That's all. Rolls and clips. <laughs> 